two things seeming opposites both be true? F. Scott Fitzgerald said it this way. Well, if I turn this on, it helps. <laughs> he didn't say that. But I <laughs> F. Scott Fitzgerald said it this way. Okay, come on. Here we go. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and retain the ability to function. I love that last dependent clause. <laughs> and retain the ability to function. Because often in our world and in our lives, we get stuck on what we think is right, what others should do, or what the truth, quote unquote, truth is. And we get lost in someone also has someone else on their side, even though they're not on ours. We get lost in the fact that because we seem to be on opposite sides of an issue, or the planet, or belief system, one of us has to be right, and one of us has to be wrong. God forbid that we ever admit that we might be wrong. <laughs> Frequently in error, but never in doubt. <laughs> so I had long planned this talk. It was on the on the wall for a long time, and and life happened this week. And a good friend of mine passed away uh, very suddenly for me, uh, not for him. He'd been struggling in a hospital that I was unaware of back in New York, and he was a director. A amazing individual and I I want to tell you a little bit about it because it touched he touched me. It touched me in so many ways. Jack Hofsis was his name. Reverend uh, and <laughs> let's let's Roma, it's great that you want to come up here, but we're not going to have that today. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'll start. Jack was his name. He was the youngest man ever to win a Tony Award for directing. He was 28 years old, and he won the Tony Award for directing The Elephant Man on Broadway. By coincidence, The Elephant Man was the first play I saw in New York when I was visiting New York when I was 18 years old. And uh, it changed my life. Never had one of those experiences where you went to the theater and you walked out and you were a different person? Well, The Elephant Man is the story of John Merrick, a man who lived in Victorian England and was marginalized for what his appearance was. He had a disease called roughly elephantitis, it's the common name for it, but that his skin cells wouldn't stop growing and he became grossly deformed and had to live and make his existence as being paraded around in Victorian circuses as a freak for people to pay to look at. This is what he looked like. This is John Merrick, the Elephant Man. The amazing thing about the play was that it opens in New York with a curtain being pulled back by the doctor who had saved John from the circus freak shows. And standing before you in the theater is a absolutely perfect man, dressed only in a diaper, young, beautiful, flawless. And as the doctor shows these slides of the actual John Merrick and describes each one of his disabilities, his deformities, the actor on stage starts to mimic them. And so by the end of the first scene, that absolutely beautiful young man who stops standing before you has turned in to John Merrick, and you along with him. And the play goes on an amazing journey of understanding what beauty is, what deformity is and that they both can exist in the same being. 
in the same moment. And points out to us quite painfully that the real hideous creatures were the ones who were standing and pointing at him. Us, who were ridiculing this man for what he looked like and for his struggle. There's an amazing, amazing part in the play that I will never forget. After John is saved from the circus and taken into the hospital to live, he is visited by an absolutely gorgeous and beautiful star of the day, a stage star, Mrs. Kendall. And she would come and visit with John and befriended him. Together they would read and study great theater. They were studying Romeo and Juliet one day when John Merrick looked at Mrs. Kendall and said, Romeo did not love Juliet. And he said, excuse me? And she said, excuse me? What do you mean Romeo did not love Juliet? And he said, he believed in illusion. He didn't go up to her and put a mirror to her mouth and to her nose to see if she was still breathing. He looked at what he thought he saw and believed Juliet to be dead. He believed his eyes. If I had been Romeo, we would have got away. If I had been Romeo, we could have got away. Can we make that our clarion call? To get away from what we think we see, what we think we know, and embrace the beauty that lies in everything, the beauty that exists in each and every being, no matter what they physically look like, no matter the words that come out of their mouths, no matter the beauty that exists when you can't see it. The ultimate irony in Jack's life, which was not lost on him, was that five years after this amazing triumph. He dove into a pool on his summer house and broke his neck. He bet, spent the rest of his life as a quadriplegic, deformed and distorted and overlooked and marginalized. And he was quoted by the New York Times as saying, I was privileged to work on this play because John Merrick has so much to teach all of us. And I do not miss the irony that he still has so much to teach me. Jack went on, after his accident, to continue to work, <clears throat> to continue to find his craft to find beauty, to find truth in places that other people didn't see it. Ten years after I saw that play in New York, I met the man who directed it, who became a really good friend and colleague. We worked together. I ate sit and listen to him. I took care of him and cleaned him and wiped him and laughed with him. And on Saturday, I sat with all of our friends and we cried and celebrated and knew the truth that there was such beauty in him that most people didn't see. There was such honesty and intelligence and simplicity. Someone at his wake turned to me and said, many were gathering, said, wow, it's really a testament to what it is to be a very kind director. Because <laughs> all the people he had worked with all celebrated. This goes beyond the elephant man. It goes beyond Jack's life. The paradox exists always for us. 
if we can hold two opposing ideas in our mind, what is disabled? Is a person who's a quadriplegic disabled? Is a person who is a model, somehow perfection and beauty? Can they both be gorgeous and can they both be hideous at the same time? Can we know that we are both beautiful and disabled? Disabled by our own thinking. Thinking that we're alone, thinking that we're separate, thinking that we're not good enough. Jack's journey to stand up, literally, to stand up and say, no, I'm still here and I still have something to contribute, was not an easy one. And it, it encouraged all of us to watch him do it. But this idea of divine paradox goes beyond this. As all of us theater intellectuals gathered and talked about Jack's funeral because his Irish Catholic family put a rosary in his hand and had an open casket and we had a funeral mass at a big Catholic church with the smells and the bells. We had incense and everything. It was great theater. Jack would have loved it. <laughs> As the, as the coffin is surrounded in smoke and the lights were <laughs> pouring in through the stained glass windows. It was something out of one of his plays. And yet, I sat and watched all of us go, oh, that's not right. Yes, it is. It was right for his sisters who were burying their brother. It was right for Jack when we can step out of having to be singularly correct, we can embrace the divine paradox. We can embrace the idea that God is personal and principle at the same time. All right? Understand that. When you can look past this and understand that God can be flesh and blood when you need it to be, it can be a man, it can be a woman, it can be whatever you need to give you comfort at that moment. It can be Jesus, it can be Buddha, and it can be the underlying principle that powers all life forward. It can be the energy of the Big Bang that underlies all manifestation. Personal and principle at the same time. When you can hold that idea into your mind to not have to make anyone else wrong, or yourself wrong because you need a God with skin on it on occasion. Who has not been there in this room when they have pleaded, oh God, help me. I don't know how to get through this. And you can feel the arms of the divine wrap you. To know that the gladiola bulb turns into the flower, that both are the same. That life and death are not separate. Death is a part of living. And that death might be, just might be, the ultimate doorway to freedom. Another irony from this last two days of my life is that his sisters, in all of their struggle to get a funeral together on short notice, booked Jack's funeral and wake into two handicapped, inaccessible places. <laughs> and you're like, this was this man's life for 30 years. And his friends who were in wheelchairs couldn't enter. And, and, Jack's free of the wheelchair. Jack is finally standing free. So, what is finite? Our disability, our diagnosis, our disease, our gender, our job. And what is infinite? Your real job? What you're called here to be and to do transcends who employs you transcends the age of our children. We get to be parents 
get to be children in all aspects of our life. That we get to be both at once, the divine child and the divine parent. And we get to be it all. Grateful for it all, also. John Merrick still has so much to teach us. If I had been Romeo, we could have got away. What is it in your life that you're looking at and not questioning whether it's real? Where are you not taking up the mirror to the seeming death and mortality in front of you and questioning it? Saying, is this true? Can we see it differently and get away? That is our call, to see it differently than the rest of the world. For we're all crazy, okay? We're all insane. And when we realize it, we can stop pointing at the freaks in the circus and embrace them. Love them, heal them, and transform life and death. In John Merrick's life, he chose at the end because of the skin growths on his head. He couldn't lay down to go to sleep. His head weighed too much for him to lay fully down. And at the end of his life, he chose to because he wanted to lay down and died, suffocated because of that choice, that conscious choice. My friend Jack laid down his physical life this week, but he's not gone from me, and he's not gone. It has been my honor and privilege to give you a little snippet, a little bit of how profoundly that man changed me, changed my life. Jack was my Romeo, and he helped me get away. As hard as it was for him to get around and to do anything, when I was ordained in New York City in 2012, he showed up at the theater and after the ordination, and gave the talk. And at the end, I was doing the meet and greet at the end of the service and Jack was there and I ran up to give him a huge hug. And he looked at me and after all of our years in the theater together, he said, wow, you left show business to become a star. <laughs> Which was from Jack was just the ultimate compliment and encapsulation of everything in my life. I miss you. I love you. And thanks for helping me get away. Let's take this to our time of meditation.